Chapter One of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Mystery The Ministry was defeated on a question of vital importance. The Premier placed the resignation of himself and colleagues in the hands of His Excellency the governor of new south wales a dissolution was granted and an appeal to the electors was shortly to take place sydney as the capital of this important colony was in a turmoil of excitement the labour members were determined to show a bold front in the city and suburban constituencies and capable men had been selected to fight for the cause capital opposed labour in order to safeguard its rights not out of any desire to deal unjustly with the men on the opposite side the strife promised to be severe and nowhere more so than in balmain east the constituency which for several years had returned as one of its members mr henry bryce the principal partner in the firm of bryce golding and company stock and station agents henry bryce was a wealthy man an example of what can be done by energy and industry aided by a fair amount of brains and well balanced by common sense he was a man nearly sixty years of age but luke ten years younger he was often heard to declare he never felt more fit for work in his life than at the present time although a hard-working man he had been a lucky man and even his station properties had turned out well the Labour Party decided to fight against Henry Bryce on this occasion. A dead set was to be made against him on account of a shearer's strike which had taken place on one of his stations. On this occasion Henry Bryce had proved victorious and managed to shear all his sheep with non-union labour. In the eyes of the leaders of the Labour Party, this was an unpardonable sin it mattered not to the labour leaders whether henry bryce fancied he was acting rightly in the matter he had no option according to their decree union labour the leaders declared must be employed and henry bryce and other squatters must obey their dictum it was of no use trying to browbeat henry bryce in this manner he had worked hard for his possessions and he meant to have a free hand in dealing with them he offered the unionists the wages asked but he declined to be bound down to employ none but union men it was on this rock henry bryce and the labour leaders had split neither side would give way and when henry bryce proved he was independent of the unionists the pill was too bitter for them to easily swallow the election gave them a chance of retaliating by opposing mr bryce for balmain east there were other members more opposed to the Labour Party than Henry Bryce, but it was the success of the latter against him in a pitched battle that had made them marshal their forces against him. This opposition only stimulated Henry Bryce to strain every nerve to retain his seat. He had been offered more than one seat in which he could walk over, but he declined and decided it should be Balmain East he would contest and abide by the decision of the electors. The fight raged bitterly, but no insults or scurrilous attacks were made on Henry Bryce. The Labour Party acknowledged he was an upright man, and had led an almost blameless life. They opposed him solely on the ground that he was not in favour of unionism. Henry Bryce resided in a fine house at Potts Point, and accordingly he generally went over the ferry to Balmain to attend meetings, and interview his constituents he had an important meeting one dark dreary night and his daughter ida bryce tried hard to persuade him not to attend mrs bryce took very little interest in politics or in fact in anything but herself it was the one great mistake henry bryce had made when he married a second time and placed a stepmother over his son and daughter i must go ida said henry bryce it is most important i dare not miss a single meeting it will be taken as a sign of weakness 
do not worry your father ida said mrs bryce you know he is wedded to politics if he failed to attend this meeting politics would bring an action for divorce against him now if i had requested him to take me to the theatre on this particular night it would have been different i am sure your persuasive powers to induce your father to remain at home would not have been expended in vain ida bryce made no reply she had long given up entering into wordy arguments with her stepmother and that lady was exasperated accordingly nothing pleasing her better than a battle of words with ida there is nothing to hinder you going to the theatre to-night if you wish said henry bryce to his wife ida will accompany you certainly if you wish it replied ida perhaps ida would prefer your political meeting said mrs bryce with a sarcastic smile nonsense said henry bryce send for tickets at once it is rather late but they will reserve you seats i am sure will you go ida asked mrs bryce if you wish it she replied i do wish it said mrs bryce harshly the girl's quiet almost contemptuous manner nettled her ida bryce knew more about her stepmother's doings than henry bryce in such matters he was often dangerously blind and trusting then it's settled said henry bryce you are for pleasure i am for business i may be rather late home there is a committee meeting after the speeches is mr golding to be there asked mrs bryce i believe so he said he would come round herbert golding was a partner in the firm of bryce golding and company ida bryce did not like herbert golding but he was a favourite with mrs bryce perhaps this accounted for the girl's antipathy to him henry bryce crossed over to balmain and attended his meeting it was reported afterwards he had never met with such a cordial reception and the committee were certain he would be returned at the head of the poll he left the meeting in excellent spirits and declining the offer of one of his chief supporters to see him safely home walked away in the direction of the ferry it was close upon midnight and a small knot of people stood on the AUSN company's wharf awaiting the arrival of the wodonga from brisbane she's late in said one of the men employed on the wharf i ain't heard a whistle yet she's entered the harbour said another man who told you silent billy was the reply it was so unusual for silent billy as the man was called to make a remark that it was evident those present doubted the information if you don't believe me ask him yourself said the man who had referred to silent billy sauntering along the wharf was a short thick-set man in a pilot jacket and slouch hat his breeches were of a dull blue and he had on heavy boots he had a stern face and his shaggy whiskers were grey and stuck out like wires this was silent billy a man seldom known to speak unless he was spoken to and then only to say the briefest possible reply say billy is the wodonga in the harbour the man made no reply but proceeded to clamber down the side of the wharf and get into a boat moored there this seemed to be positive proof that the wodonga was close at hand for silent billy generally went out in his boat to catch the rope thrown to him from the steamer which having made fast to one of the seats he rowed with it back to the wharf this was a necessary operation to enable the wodonga to swing round and back into the wharf silent billy pulled out from the wharf and no sooner had he done so than a boom was heard followed by a sharp whistle that's the wodonga round in the point billy was right he's a wonderful man is billy said one of the men on the wharf they watched silent billy slowly pulling out into the stream then the faint outline of a big steamer was seen in the darkness and presently her saloon lights were visible gleaming out from her huge side a man stood in the bow of the steamer with a rope coiled in his hand ready to throw to billy in the boat he was about to fling it was suddenly seen to fall back off his seat and sprawl in the bottom of his boat what's up billy 
yelled the man on the steamer. Silent Billy scrambled quickly up and looked over the side of his boat. He made a grab at something floating in the water. The old fellow shuddered as his fingers clutched the saturated clothes of a drowned man. Man overboard! Hold hard! shouted Billy. Wait till I get him aboard! He tugged hard at the body, but failed to drag it into his boat. Seeing it was impossible to do this, he made the body fast with a piece of rope to the stern of his boat, and then signalled to the man on the steamer to fling his rope to him. When the end came whizzing into the boat with a thud, Silent Billy commenced to row back to the wharf. The people on the wharf all crowded to the side to see the object Billy had in tow. His mishap had been seen from the wharf, and many were the surmises as to the cause of Silent Billy, who was such a good oarsman, catching a crab. Billy slung the rope of the steamer onto the wharf, and then said, Give us a hand with this poor devil, afore she comes alongside and swamps us. The body of the unfortunate man was hauled onto the wharf, and carried under the sheds until the arrival of the water police. Only a dim light shone on the wharf, and the face of the drowned man was scarcely visible. The Wodonga came alongside, and one of the first passengers to come ashore was Dr. Langside. He had seen what occurred from the deck of the Wodonga, and hurried ashore to see if he could be of any assistance. Dr. Langside followed Silent Billy to the sheds, and here he found two men in the familiar uniform of the water police, looking seriously at the body. They recognised Dr. Langside, who was well known in Sydney, and one of them said, "'This is a sad business, Doctor. I'm afraid there's been foul play.' "'Do you know who it is?' asked the Doctor. "'Yes, sir, and so do you, I expect. Luke.' and the policeman drew a handkerchief off the drowned man's face. Dr. Langside started back in amazement. "'Good heavens!' he exclaimed. "'It's Henry Price! Whatever does this mean?' He at once proceeded to examine the body of the unfortunate Henry Bryce, who, but a few short hours before, had been full of life and health, and eager to fight his election battles again. "'Dead, undoubtedly!' said Dr. Langside. Look here, Williams, he's been struck a heavy blow on the back of the head. This blow was enough to render him insensible. He must have been knocked down and pushed into the water, or have been struck when near the edge of the wharf and fallen in. Looks like a case of murder, said W.P. Constable Williams. There will have to be an inquest, said the doctor. Word had better be sent to his house, said the constable. I will go there myself, said Dr. Langside. I know Miss Bryce well. And as Dr. Langside drove in a cab to the residence of the Bryces at Pops Point, he thought of the unfortunate man lying dead on the wharf, and muttered to himself, It's a mysterious affair. I wonder how it will turn out. When young Ted Bryce hears of this, there'll be a day of reckoning for someone, sooner or later. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Who Did It」by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. No Trace When Ida Bryce and her stepmother returned from the theatre, they found Henry Bryce had not arrived. It was after eleven, but Ida was not anxious about her father, as he said he might return late. Twelve o'clock struck, and he had not returned and even Mrs. Bryce commenced to feel uneasy. She was a selfish woman, with hardly a thought for others, but Henry Bryce had been such an indulgent husband that he had aroused what small amount of feeling there was in her. "'I wish your father would come, Ida,' she said. "'I have never known him to be so late.' "'He ought not to have gone on a night like this,' replied Ida. "'He is so venturesome, and he always refuses to have the carriage to meet him.' They sat looking at the clock on the mantelpiece, until it was just on the stroke of one, when Ida Bryce started from her seat and said, "'There's a cab coming up the drive. I am glad he has returned.' 
I'm tired and want to go to bed. That play was so dull it nearly sent me to sleep. Ida Bryce, in her anxiety to welcome her father home, rushed out of the room into the hall just as the door was opened. When she saw Dr. Langside, she turned white and gasped. My father, where is he? Why are you here? Is anything the matter, Dr. Langside? As a medical man, Dr. Langside had been placed in many painful and difficult positions, but as he looked at Ida's face, he thought he had never had such a hard task set him before. He knew how Henry Bryce was beloved by his children, and he dreaded the effect of the terrible news he had to tell upon a girl of Ida's temperament. "'Your mother up, Miss Bryce?' he asked in order to gain a moment's respite. "'My stepmother is in the dining-room,' said Ida. "'But where's my father? Have you seen him? Has he met with an accident? Is he hurt?' "'I've seen your father,' he said quietly, "'and he has met with an accident. "'Come into the dining-room and I will tell you both about it.' "'His tone of voice somewhat reassured Ida, "'and she led the way into the dining-room. "'Father has met with an accident,' she said. "'Dr. Langside is here. He has seen him.' "'Mrs. Bryce looked startled, "'but she received the news more calmly than Ida.' Dr. Langside shook hands with her, and then, standing, looked gravely at them. "'Where did it happen? Tell me all about it,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'I only arrived from Brisbane by the Wodonga to-night,' commenced Dr. Langside. "'When I stepped onto the wharf, my services were required to attend a man who had been in the water.' He looked closely at Ida Bryce. He knew she would be more nearly affected than Mrs. Bryce. "'You can imagine how shocked I was when I discovered it was your father, Miss Bryce, who had met with an accident. I attended to him at once. I did all I possibly could for him.' "'Go on,' said Ida Bryce, in a hollow voice. Mrs. Bryce was also much agitated. "'I'm sorry to say your father has met with a very serious accident. I doubt if he will recover,' he said, hesitatingly. "'You have no doubts.' said Ida slowly. You know he will not recover. Dr. Langside bowed his head in acknowledgment. Ida Bryce stepped up to him and clasped his arm. Is my father dead? she said with a shudder. Ida, how can you? came from Mrs. Bryce. Dr. Langside took Ida Bryce by the hand and said quietly, Miss Bryce, your father is dead. He was dead when I saw him. Mrs. Bryce uttered a piercing scream and proceeded to moan in a most lamentable fashion, rocking herself to and fro and wringing her hands. Ida Bryce merely sank down into a chair and seemed dazed and crushed. She hardly realised the blow she had received. Dr. Langside wished she would burst into tears, but her eyes remained dry. Her grief was too deep even for tears to flow freely. Dr. Langside remained in the house all night. In the morning he found Ida Bryce better. That she was still suffering terribly, he could see, and he endeavoured to rouse her. "'I will at once send a wire to your brother,' he said. "'Is he on the station?' "'Yes, at Munda Station,' said Ida. "'Please meet him at the railway station when he arrives and explain to him. "'Poor Ted! It will be an awful blow to him.' "'How long will it take him to reach here?' asked Dr. Langside. "'He will not arrive until tomorrow," said Ida. "'The inquest will be held to-day,' said Dr. Langside. "'After it is over, your father will be brought home.' Ida shuddered. The mere thought of an inquest being held over her dead father was an additional blow. "'It is necessary,' said Dr. Langside. "'There may have been foul play. I am sure your brother will be anxious to hear the truth.' "'Foul play?' said Ida. "'What do you mean? My father had not an enemy in the world.' "'He may have had one, Miss Bryce, and it may be that one who has caused his death. "'You'll see it all in the papers, so I may as well tell you. "'I believe your father was struck down by a violent blow on the head, "'and then either fell or was thrown into the water.' "'Oh, this is dreadful,' moaned Ida. 
and to think i was at the theatre last night laughing and enjoying myself at the very time she sobbed hysterically you cannot blame yourself for that miss bryce he said kindly every one knows what an affectionate daughter you were and how dearly you loved your father after a short conversation dr langside left her and promised to return when the inquest was over mrs bryce appeared inconsolable she made a far greater outward show of grief than ida she was genuinely sorry for her husband's death but as the day wore on she became equally anxious on her own account and wondered how henry bryce had made his will the inquest was held the morning papers had gathered particulars about the accident and the community at large felt a severe shock at the death of such a well-known and much respected man as henry bryce as the inquest proceeded and the news appeared in the evening papers it was discovered that what had befallen henry bryce was no accident but would probably at the conclusion be called by the much uglier word of murder one of the evening papers in an early edition alluded to the supposed murder of mr henry bryce the same paper even went so far as to crow over its rivals in a later edition and went on to point out how they had first published the fact that mr henry bryce was murdered it was not even thought indecorous to make capital out of the dead man and the sub-editor was complimented by his chief on his foresight and acumen in being the first in the field with such an important piece of news nothing sensational was brought out at the inquest the coroner tried to look wise and put on an air of importance he did not get such a man as the late henry bryce to sit upon every day in the week he felt that this was no ordinary case and consequently prolonged it and gloated over it in a manner that surprised even the reporters and it takes a lot to surprise a pressman had the inquest been on the body of tom smith wharf labourer the coroner would have apologised for calling the jury together and explained that it was merely a matter of form and hinted that the sooner they got through with it the better it is surprising what a vast difference there is between a wharf labourer and a millionaire even when death is supposed to have levelled all ranks so the coroner puffed himself out with windy dignity and reproved a juryman for levity when he sneezed and actually threatened to order him out of court if the offence was repeated as the atmosphere of the court was somewhat ticklish to sensitive nostrils the juryman may be pardoned for his breach of decorum dr langside never had much respect for the coroner and what little he had vanished before the inquest on poor henry bryce was over the coroner cross-questioned witnesses as to the as to the private relations of the deceased with his family he even went so far as to say the inquest ought to be adjourned in order that edward bryce might be present the fact of edward bryce being five hundred miles from sydney at the time weighed not an atom with the coroner after deliberating for some minutes he kindly consented out of deference to the feelings of the deceased's family to waive the point of edward bryce's presence dr langside felt inclined to wave his fist in the coroner's face and looked so contemptuously at him that the coroner asked him if he wished to make any further remarks as dr langside had already given his evidence and been recalled five times he candidly admitted he could throw no more light on the subject the coroner summed up this was his chance he summarised the evidence he dilated for fully an hour on the salient points of the case he flung arguments at the jury with such rapidity and inaccurate aim as to the points he intended to make that the good men and true were bathed in perspiration and bewilderment having exhausted his skirmishers he brought up his heavy reserves and said gentlemen i will now read over the evidence the juryman glanced at the piles of fool's cap and one of the gentlemen groaned audibly the coroner heard him and said in a sympathetic manner that it was a painful scene and he fully endorsed the groan of the affected juryman at last the inquest came to an end 
and the jury returned a verdict of wilful murder against some person or persons unknown the coroner said that was a rather large order but the jury felt it was their turn and declined to amend their verdict henry bryce's funeral was an enormous procession and although scores of people followed who had never spoken to the dead man in their lives they had known him by repute as an upright man edward bryce herbert golding and dr langside were the chief mourners and occupied the first coach in after years this incident was brought vividly to the minds of two of them edward bryce was terribly shocked at the news of his father's death he could not understand it like his sister he did not believe his father had an enemy in the world once however the bare fact was brought home to him that his father had met with foul play it was as dr langside had thought young bryce was determined there should be a day of reckoning for the man or men who had killed his father the police did their best the police as a rule do their duty and get very little credit for it they got none in this case the reporters badgered them for information and when the police informed them quite truthfully that they had no information to give the papers stated the police decline to give us information but believe they have a clue which will lead to the apprehension of the perpetrator of the crime when the police read this they were mad there was no clue the chief would have given a year's salary of the best police reporter in sydney to have obtained even the smallest bit of a clue but the papers were so persistent in saying that the police had a clue that the detectives in charge of the case began to think there must originally have been a clue and that it had been lost edward bryce was anxious about this clue he offered five hundred pounds reward for information that would lead to the arrest and conviction of his father's assailant or assailants that five hundred pounds made the police hunt for clues in all sorts of impossible and improbable directions how it got about no one knew but a rumour commenced to circulate that the union shearers had something to do with henry bryce's untimely death no more scandalous rumour was ever circulated said the union men it was a political dodge to damage the labour party at the general election edward bryce did not believe the unionist shearers were responsible for the outrage and he said so openly the men applauded him and swore there should be no more trouble at munda station next shearing how they kept their word will be seen later on there was no trace of the man or men who had attacked henry bryce and the police honestly confessed the whole affair was shrouded in mystery End of chapter 2chapter three of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain the new member henry bryce was not the man to die and leave no last will and testament behind him his will was duly proved and his executors were his son edward herbert golding his partner and dr langside it was a surprise to dr langside when he heard that he was one of the executors he had attended the late mr bryce on more than one occasion but did not think that he had been regarded in any other light than an ordinary medical man herbert golding was not surprised he was made an executor but he was surprised when he found dr langside had also been appointed the appointment irritated him although he gave no outward sign it did so the will was an equitable one the bulk of the estate was divided between edward bryce and his sister ida the former taking munda and other stations and a large share in the firm of bryce golding and company mrs bryce had fifty thousand pound cash and the house furniture and effects at potts point on condition ida was allowed to reside there if she desired dr langside and herbert golding received five hundred pounds each everyone was satisfied although mrs bryce expected more and said so 
but the amount she received was too handsome for her to speak slightingly of it. It became necessary to find a candidate to take Henry Bryce's place in Balmain East constituency. Edward Bryce was asked to take his father's place, but he submitted he was too young and declined. After some discussion, in which heated arguments were advanced for and against, for he was not a particularly popular man, Herbert Golding was asked to stand. After, as he stated, giving the matter his most serious consideration, he consented. Herbert Golding was a man with an immense opinion of his own importance, carefully concealed behind a mask of outwardly pious and benevolent characteristics. He was a very different man to his dead partner, Henry Bryce. It is surprising how two men, directly opposite in character, managed to hit it off well in business. Henry Bryce was a bluff, hearty, hail-fellow well-met sort of man. He made no boast of possessing religious principles. He seldom went to church, but he did not think he should be refused admittance to the abode of the just on that account. He was probably right. He lived honestly and did many kindly actions. He hated hypocrisy and cant, and towards the latter end of his life, he commenced to think Herbert Golding was a bit of a humbug. Herbert Golding was not a bad-looking man. He was a bachelor about forty years of age, or a few years younger, and a favourite with the ladies. He was tall, had a good figure, and looked a gentleman. His face was clean-shaved, and he had mild blue eyes, which seemed to look benevolently on all mankind. His smile was not fascinating. It had something of the sneer in it. Had he cultivated a moustache, it would have been a decided sneer. He was very particular in his dress. He always wore dark clothes, and they were always of the best, but cut in an unassuming fashion. Herbert Golding always wore a top hat. Even in the intense heat of summer, he would not discard his shiny beaver. He attended church regularly, in fact was a shining light, and acted as vicar's church warden. The congregation at the particular church he favoured with his presence looked up to him and regarded him as a model man. The male members placed implicit confidence in him and took his advice on matters concerning their financial welfare. The female members made a fuss of him. There was no danger connected with such a moral man as Herbert Golding. His vicar regarded his churchwarden as his right-hand man and relied upon him in everything. Herbert Golding was one of the founders and chairman of the directors of the Amalgamated Land and Investment Banking and Financial Company. A long name, but Herbert Golding was fond of high-sounding titles, and he had bestowed the name upon the company himself. He had wished to add half a dozen more words to the name of the company, but when a director pointed out that special envelopes would have to be made in order to get the address on, he gave way. Amalgamated Land and Investment Banking and Financial Company, he refused to budge from, and the name was adopted. The company flourished exceedingly, and gave 10% to depositors. Herbert Golding was regarded as a munificent benefactor to the human race of modest investors. Henry Bryce declined to have any share in this company, and he was lamentably deficient in common sense, so his partner said, for not investing a few thousands on fixed deposit at 10%. When Herbert Golding pressed the matter, Henry Bryce had said, 10% eh, Golding? That's very nice for the depositors if it lasts, but how about the poor devils your company lends money to? What interest do you charge them to pay 10% on fixed deposits and clear working expenses? No, Golding, that company won't suit me. Get some of your congregational friends to invest in it, I dare say your parson would put in a trifle. The black cloth gentry are desperately keen on ten per cent. Herbert Golding had replied, As you like, but I can assure you it's a capital investment and as safe a concern as there is in Sydney. Such a highly respectable man as Herbert Golding must stand a good chance for Balmain East, said his supporters. 
although somewhat prosy in his style herbert golding was not a bad speaker he had a good voice and a convincing way of putting things he held out the part he had taken in establishing the amalgamated land and investment etc company as a sop to the labour party and the working men stating the company had been established mainly to benefit the workers who could now obtain a large percentage for their small savings he had nothing to do with shearing strikes in fact he was in favour of unionism he eulogised the late henry bryce but said he could not agree with him on the labour question herbert golding had no hesitation in using his dead partner's name as a lever wherewith to hoist himself into the legislative assembly there was not much time in which to work the electorate but herbert golding did his best he was here there and everywhere and it was surprising the number of people holding exactly opposite views that he agreed with on one point he remained firm much to the disgust of the committee he would have nothing to do with the licensed victuallers he went dead against them and in favour of the local option without compensation he had his reward the next sunday when at church as the vicar pointedly alluded to him in his discourse and held him up as a man who would not pander to the vices of the community after service he was congratulated on all sides after his dinner a remarkably good one for a bachelor he uncorked a bottle of his favourite port and smiled success to temperance herbert golding preferred to be esteemed morally rather than politically when the day of the election came herbert golding felt anxious as to the result if he won in the face of his opposition to the lva it would be a great moral victory if defeated he could assume a resigned attitude and point to the vile influence that had been at work against him he was not defeated he was triumphant he smote the labour candidate and the lva candidate hip and thigh he was surprised at his success he headed the poll by a large majority that bryce affair did it said the labour members herbert golding cared very little what circumstances had assisted in placing him at the head of the poll he was a member for balmain east and that was enough for him he could add m l a after his name and write his letters from that wonderful menagerie known as the parliament buildings in macquarie street he was a member of the legislative assembly a lawmaker a power in the land he could feather his own nest out of the pickings in the treasury if there were any left and he would be paid three hundred pound a year by a confiding people for doing it the mere thought of this made herbert golding look more pious and benevolent than ever and his blue eyes fairly gleamed with sympathy for suffering humanity truly it was a veritable triumph and the righteous had prospered the morning papers congratulated balmain east on possessing such an admirable representative poor henry bryce whose body was hardly cold in its grave was forgotten he might have been dead years one paper hinted that such a man as herbert golding could not long be kept out of the ministry herbert golding read all these notices he actually purchased a book for newspaper cuttings and pasted them in such testimonials to his worth ought not he felt be lost to posterity the new member was elated he had forgotten all about his dead partner before edward bryce returned to munda station he had gone thoroughly into his father's affairs and dr langside had assisted him considerably herbert golding was extremely obliging and showed every consideration to the family of his late partner he was to have sole management of the firm in sydney as edward bryce said he did not care for a town life ida bryce decided to remain with her stepmother for a time but she confided to her brother she did not think it would be for long we shall not agree ted she said when i find the situation irksome i intend to apply to you for a situation as housekeeper at munda come whenever you like ida he said the place has never been the same since you left old wideawake says you were the only cheerful object within a radius of forty miles 
poor old wide awake said ida what an honest old fellow he is i'm sure there's a mystery about that man ted he's not always been a station hand i don't think he has said ted bryce he's an amusing old chap and he's well named he's a sharp customer and i like him and he's fond of you but who could help being so she added all the good qualities i may happen to possess i inherit from dear old dad said ted bryce sorrowfully was there ever such another man in the world no he was indeed a good kind father said his sister in a broken voice oh if i could only lay my hands on the man who murdered him said her brother clenching his fists it will come to light some day i want nothing better than to stand face to face with the man who struck him down then you're quite sure it was murder said ida yes said ted bryce i'm certain of it and so is dr langside in that case vengeance will surely overtake the man who did the deed said ida End of chapter three Chapter four of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Munda. Munda station was about five hundred miles west from Sydney on the western line. It was an immense station, covering about forty square miles of country. Louth was the nearest township, and Burke, about ninety miles distant, the nearest railway station. Munda was not a particularly enchanting place, but it was a good station in a season when rain was plentiful. About a hundred and thirty thousand sheep was an average shearing. Young Edward Bryce, at his own request, had been appointed manager at Munda, with several experienced men under him. Like his sister, he preferred the country to the town, and when he visited Sydney, he always felt stifled in the city, and was not sorry when the time came for him to return to munda and comparative solitude town-bred men can never understand the charm of the lonely life some men lead on stations they would die of ennui in less than a month they cannot enter into or share the peculiar delight these station men out in the back blocks of australia take in their existence edward bryce had he so wished could have been a man about town with a place in his father's business house more as an excuse for an occupation than anything else his father would have made him an ample allowance but edward bryce was not built that way he did not mean to lead an idle useless life merely because his father had made money he was not a fop and had no inclination to do the block in pitt street and ogle the fair maidens of sydney who exposed their charms there dangling after the girls he considered not exactly a waste of time but a neglecting of opportunities yet edward bryce was no confirmed bachelor he was not a selfish man and nine out of every ten unmarried men are selfish on one of his trips to sydney he made the acquaintance of miss flora hanworth a sister of wyndham hanworth a well-known australian artist who was a great friend of edward bryce's if there was one thing ted bryce loved more than any other it was pictures he was fond of visiting the art gallery in sydney and one day he was pointing out to his sister what he considered a mistake in a bush scene signed w h the man who painted that is an artist said ted bryce but he's made a mistake i never saw a sheep lie down like that in my life and i've seen some hundreds of thousands drop down both from a desire to do so from exhaustion and from death i wish i had w h at munda for a week i'd soon prove to him where he was wrong he's a clever fellow all the same but i'll bet he never painted that sheep from life you're perfectly correct said a melodious voice behind them which made edward bryce and his sister turn round hurriedly they saw a good-looking man of about thirty smiling kindly at them ida bryce saw at a glance that he had a mobile face a heavy dark moustache clear dark eyes was not tall but carried himself well and looked as he had spoken like an educated man of the world i did not paint that sheep from life he added then i presume you are w h the painter of that picture said edward bryce he spoke without the least embarrassment 
and the artist at once liked him for it had edward bryce commenced to make apologies for criticising the picture the painter would have formed an unfavourable opinion of him i am my name is wyndham hanworth he said i heard your remarks they are perfectly just that sheep is the blot in the picture did you hear all i said asked ted bryce yes i could not resist the temptation of listening to an unbiased criticism of my work said wyndham hanworth then will you accept my invitation and come to munda and study sheep asked ted bryce with a frank smile with pleasure said the artist it is too kind of you to invite me not at all it will be a pleasure to me to have a real live artist on the premises i am very fond of pictures good pictures i mean not like that and he pointed to an impossible figure of an undraped woman ida bryce had time to observe the artist closely during this conversation and she thought she would like him she did like him when she knew him well and that meeting in the art gallery had sealed a lasting friendship between the bryces and the hanworths wyndham hanworth was not one of those men who did not believe in criticism but he knew when a critic was up to his work he knew also there were faults in his pictures and he was only too glad to have them pointed out to him by men who knew more than he did it does not follow that a man need be an artist to criticise pictures or an actor to criticise acting or an author to review books yet there are painters actors and authors who declare that they do not believe in criticisms even go so far as to say they never read them how can you judge of the worth of criticism if you never read criticisms asked wyndham hanworth of a brother artist and the question remained unanswered because it is unanswerable the man who places himself above criticism is seldom worth being criticised wyndham hanworth must be left to himself for the present munda station and edward bryce demand attention when edward bryce reached munda on his return from his father's funeral in sydney he felt for the first time in his life the loneliness of his surroundings it seemed to him he missed his father's presence although henry bryce seldom visited munda during the last few years of his life his son always felt his absent father's presence about the homestead i must have a mate here for a time he mused i never felt this depression before but it is not to be wondered at when i think how dear old dad died and that i could not see him alive once more edward bryce called his father dad it might sound childish to the modern young man but when edward bryce said dad there was a world of affection in his voice and there was not a man in all australia who would have cared to hint the use of that word was ridiculous henry bryce had always been dad to his children and such endearing terms as the governor the old fossil the pater or the old man were not familiar in the bryce family i wonder if wyndham would come and take compassion on me he went on it will be shearing time soon and i fancy he would be able to paint a good picture with a shearing shed for a model hang it all i'll try him it takes a letter such a time to reach sydney i'll send a wire hello there yes yeah, sir what is it oh it's you wide awake is it said ted as a man stood in the doorway i want to send a telegram to sydney at once tell one of the lads to saddle up yes yeah, sir said the man the telegram's to mr hanworth said ted you remember him rather said wide awake he's a real good sort and he's a first-class artist so he is said ted i'm asking him to come and spend a few weeks with me i feel a bit lonely no wonder said wide awake shaking his head and come back here and keep me company said ted bryce when you've seen the telegram sent off wide awake disappeared i wonder who the deuce that man is said ted bryce to himself old wide awake and he's not an old man by any means it is the only name he's ever been known by here he's about the best man we have on munda and that's a large order wide awake returned and ted bryce asked him to sit down and have a pipe handing him his pouch at the same time there is considerably more freedom between master and man on an australian station than between men of similar standing in the old country 
on a big station are occasionally found broken down swells not in health but in pocket who are by no means depressed at their unlucky turn of fortune's wheel and who to their credit be it said often turn out real good men old wide awake as he was called had been picked up by ted bryce at burke during the race week young bryce had taken a fancy to old wide awake's looks and engaged him as a general hand about the homestead the man interested him and although he declined to give any name or the least information as to his antecedents or where he came from the young squatter had no reason to regret the trust he placed in him it is an awful thing this murder of my father said ted bryce news is slow in finding its way to these back country spots and wide awake although he knew of henry bryce's death did not know of the manner in which he had come to an untimely end murdered said wide awake you surely do not mean to say your father met with foul play such a man as your father could not have many enemies there can be no doubt unfortunately about the foul play replied ted he had a terrible blow on the back of his head which knocked him insensible dr langside says he was either knocked into the water or thrown in afterwards very strange said wide awake and have the police no clue was he robbed no said ted he was not robbed there was no motive of gain in the mind of the man who did the deed at least no immediate gain by robbery that is the strange part of the affair my father had attended an election meeting he was the candidate on our side for balmain east it was as he returned from the meeting he was attacked some people were inclined to blame the union men for it but i do not hold that opinion the unionists go too far sometimes but i do not think they would commit a cowardly act like that they'd fire a shed and poison non-unionists said wide awake that has been done ted bryce was silent he knew such things had taken place but still he did not think the men would treacherously murder an old man in cold blood excited by rioting they might commit desperate acts but this was a different matter altogether will anyone benefit by your father's death asked wide awake no one outside the family herbert golding his partner in the firm retains his portion and is now manager he has also been elected member for balmain east in place of my father they asked me to stand but i declined i think it only reasonable that mr golding should have been put in then the whole affair's a mystery said wide awake yes replied ted i've offered a reward of five hundred pounds for information that will lead to the conviction of the murderer i've an idea something may be gleaned about it during net shearing said wide awake how said ted surprised well you see we get a lot of all sorts of men around munda at that time and if you adopt your father's plan and decline to shear under union rules we shall have a very mixed lot indeed here and a heap of ruffians who will loaf about and sponge on a union camp yes said ted what then these men talk a lot the death of your father is sure to crop up i'll keep my ears open and learn what they have to say something may leak out we can never tell even the faintest clue sometimes turns out strong when followed up i don't believe any of the shearers were responsible for my father's death said ted perhaps not but you know there are men who hang on to the union ranks who are out and out scoundrels it's these men who commit all the outrages and the union men suffer for it said wide awake perhaps you're right said ted but where's the motive for such an outrage if we could discover the motive the perpetrator of the crime might be traced depend upon it the man or men who murdered your father were instigated to commit the crime by some individual desirous of getting rid of him said wide awake that may be so said ted but i have no idea who could possibly be anxious to remove my father time alone may reveal that said wide awake i do not believe crimes such as this are allowed to go unpunished sooner or later the evil doer is unmasked the longer his crime remains undiscovered the greater his punishment he carries about with him a load of guilt that crushes him down his burden becomes greater than he can bear and as he can confide in no one 
gets no one to share the weight of his terrible secret at last he voluntarily confesses his guilt i've often read of cases where men confess to a murder after years of silence death to them is preferable to carrying their frightful load of guilt and they have no dread of the scaffold no man ever sinned and remained unpunished his punishment may not be publicly known but he suffers torture in secret he is condemned by himself by the weight of evidence he adduces against himself and upon which he convicts himself to years of misery worse than mere imprisonment or death a guilty man at liberty sees in each fellow-man a possible accuser he lives in daily hourly dread of the arresting hand upon his shoulder he looks at his fellow-men in the face in fear and trembling believe me a guilty man at liberty is more bound and fettered than a man who lawfully suffers for his crime ted bryce looked hard at wide awake as he spoke these words vehemently and with some emotion yours must have been a strange life said ted it has said wide awake i know what a guilty man must suffer because i have borne the burden of a guilt not my own i know how i have suffered being guiltless what then must be the suffering of a man knowing himself guilty of a crime for which an innocent man is blamed ted bryce placed his hand on old wide awake's shoulder and looked him in the face i believe what you say he said i know i can trust you keep your name and your secret i do not want to learn either but remember this if ever you want a friend to assist you think of me and i will not fail you there's my hand on it wide awake god bless you said wide awake as he grasped ted bryce's hand then he turned and left the room End of chapter four chapter five of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain the artist when wyndham hanworth received edward bryce's telegram he at once sent a reply that he would leave sydney for munda in a couple of days wyndham hanworth was rapidly advancing in his profession which he dearly loved and several of his pictures had fetched fair prices before he left for munda he called to see ida bryce ida was always pleased to see him she admired him and wished she could assist him in his work she was also very fond of flora hanworth who kept house for her brother as they were orphans and had earned their own living for several years she knew her brother was partial to flora and she did not wonder at it for the artist's sister was an amiable attractive girl of a refined disposition and well educated i'm glad to see you mr hanworth said ida you are quite a stranger it seems ages since i saw you last wyndham hanworth smiled as he replied not ages miss bryce i called here three weeks ago ah said ada with a sigh poor old dad was alive then his death has been and still is hardly realized by me i seem to fancy he will return home at any moment no one could have been more shocked or have sympathized with you more deeply than my sister and myself i owe much of my success to your father miss bryce he purchased several of my pictures and that assisted me at a critical time said wyndham my father admired your work he did not profess to be a judge of painting but he bought pictures that pleased him i should never buy a picture myself because a certain artist painted it i should always buy the picture that gave me the most pleasure to look at said ida there you are right said the artist i often think that the gaudy coloured pictures we see in a humble dwelling give the occupants as much pleasure or more than a nobleman's gallery affords him but i did not come here to talk shop miss bryce he added i have received a telegram from your brother he says he feels lonely at munda and asks me to go and spend a week or two with him and you will go said ida eagerly yes miss bryce i can understand his feelings i leave to-morrow said wyndham hanworth you are my brother's best friend said ida i am anxious about him he seems altered since dad's death i am afraid he will never rest until he has traced out the perpetrators of the outrage i will do all in my power to rouse him said wyndham 
i shall also be able to obtain some sketches the shearing will be on soon and i may perhaps be persuaded to remain until it commences i do hope you will said ida i will ask flora to stay with me here until your return that is very kind of you he said i shall be glad to know she is left in such safe hands she is a most delightful companion said ida mrs bryce came into the room and wyndham shook hands with her he did not like mrs bryce like many other people he could never understand henry bryce marrying her when mrs bryce heard he was going to munda she merely said give my love to edward i hope you will have a pleasant visit perhaps he has some pet horses or dogs or a tame kangaroo he wants you to paint for him edward always appears to place animals on a higher level than human beings perhaps it is because he is associated with them more i think ted likes animals said ida quietly because they are true and faithful to people who are kind to them in my short experience i have often found human beings are seldom grateful and often sneer at people who are unselfish enough to do them good turns wyndham hanworth felt it was time to make his adieu and accordingly did so ida bryce went to the door with him and said my stepmother i am afraid is not overwhelmed with love for either ted or myself be sure if ted asks you say i am quite contented here i feel it is my duty to remain for a time but i do not think i can bear it much longer wyndham hanworth understood her and merely said he would do as she wished ida said mrs bryce when she returned to the room i cannot understand why you make such a fuss of a man in mr hanworth's position he is an artist said ida he is also a gentleman i do not make a fuss of him he would be the first to resent fussiness from any one he is not a suitable companion for a girl in your position said mrs bryce a painter a man who paints sheep and bush scenes and huts and hovels and such things my father sold sheep and bush scenes and huts and hovels and such things said ida don't talk nonsense ida your father was a stock and station agent not a painter said mrs bryce we shall not agree on the subject said ida so let it rest my father did not object to wyndham hanworth your father often made acquaintance outside his own circle that it would have been better for him had he not done so said mrs bryce ida bryce was about to reply in a manner that would have caused mrs bryce to fly into a passion by hinting that her stepmother was one of the undesirable acquaintances in question she refrained however and merely said i shall ask flora hanworth to stay with me during her brother's absence if you have no objection but i have objection said mrs bryce flora hanworth is beneath you in social position not at all said ida she is a lady there are no lower grades in the ranks of ladies i will not have flora hanworth staying in my house said mrs bryce and i am afraid i shall have to go and stay with flora said ida i have no doubt we shall manage very well together in fact i should rather enjoy it i forbid you to do anything of the kind said mrs bryce if flora does not come here i shall most certainly go there if she will have me said ida mrs bryce knew ida well and had not the least doubt she would do as she said your father spoils both you and edward said mrs bryce he was the best father that ever lived said ida dear old dad ida do not be so absurd absurd said ida yes calling your father dad it is childish said mrs bryce then i shall always remain childish said ida he was dad to me alive he is dad to me now more than ever you cannot understand it is useless for me to explain all that simple word means to me ida left the room feeling she could not keep her tears back Wyndham Hanworth left by the night mail for Burke. It was a tedious journey, and he was heartily tired of the train when it steamed into Burke Station. He took the coach to Louth, and there Edward Bryce met him with a buggy and pair. "'You're a good fellow to take compassion on my loneliness, Wyn," said Ted Bryce. "'I know what an awful drag that five hundred miles of a railway journey is, especially in this sort of weather.' 
I can tell you, old man, we're in for a scorcher. At Monday yesterday, it was over a hundred under the veranda. A hot welcome, Ted, said the artist. A very hot welcome. All the same, I'm glad to see you. Have you brought your tackle with you? said Ted. Fishing tackle? asked Wyndham. Now, you're better at catching expressions and finishing touches than fishes. You know what I mean. All the cargo into the buggy, or perhaps I'd better send a wagon for the stock in trade, if it's very bulky. Don't chaff, Ted. It does not become you. Be serious and sober-minded, and drive me at a steady pace to Munda. Mind, I distinctly said, at a steady pace. The last time those greys flew over the ground. I believe they are the very pair. Is there an accident insurance office handy? he asked. I'll not kill you, Wynne, said Ted, laughing. I'll strap you in if you prefer it. Joking apart, I'll go steady, in deference to your shattered city nervous system. Fifteen miles an hour. How will that suit you? Halve it, my boy, halve it, said Wyndham. Fifteen miles an hour. I shall be a thing of shreds and patches, long before we reach Munda, if you drive at that pace. By this time, Hanworth's baggage was put in the buggy, and in a few minutes they were off. How those greys could travel! They disdained to trot, and preferred a good gallop when their master was willing. They seemed to revel in the exercise, and the buggy and its occupants did not trouble them in the least. "'This is glorious,' said the artist, with evident satisfaction. "'Beats your towns hollow,' said Ted. "'Yes,' replied his companion. "'There's plenty of scope here,' and he waved his hand. For miles and miles there was nothing but open country. The grass was fast being burnt up with the scorching sun, turning to a dingy brown, and already cracks were to be seen in the baked ground. Still, the want of rain had not been severely felt as yet. It was a wonderful sight, this vast tract of land, level as a billiard-table on every side. "'I wish some rain would come,' said Ted Bryce. "'It will be getting serious in another couple of weeks. The river is low, but navigable still.' That will not last long, and we know what to expect when the darling dries up. Want of water is the great drawback here, said the artist. What a paradise this place would be if the rain could be depended upon. How do these artesian bores act? Very well, but we cannot get them on this side of the river. The nature of the ground will not allow it. They have them on Dunlop, and there has been an immense supply of water from them. I believe one or two are nearly exhausted, and the remainder are shortening in supply. For my own part, I do not think they are permanent. I wish they were. It would be a grand thing for the country if these bores were inexhaustible, said Wyndham. Yes, replied Ted. They are, however, wonderful even now, and who knows in time what further discoveries may be made. When do you commence shearing? asked Wyndham. Probably next week. We are hurrying up, because if the drought gets very bad, it will stop us, said Ted. I want you to paint a picture of our shearing shed, Wyn. I'm sure you would make a big hit with it. There's such a variety in it for you, and it would be a real Australian scene. You may see some fun here. I'm not going to sign the union agreement, and I fancy Munda will be made a test shed. I thought the union men swore there would be no trouble at Munda again, when you disbelieved the rumours circulated that your father's death was caused by some of these men, said Wyndham. The men were sincere when they said it, replied Ted, but the union is all-powerful, and unionists must obey orders, no matter what their own particular intentions may be. But that's tyranny, said Wyndham. Exactly so, replied Ted. There are no more tyrannical men on the face of the earth than the unionist leaders. I think they do not understand freedom of contract, because they have no freedom amongst themselves. I do not blame the men for all the trouble and strikes. I blame their leaders. Many of these leaders are nothing more than paid agitators, frothy-mouthed windbags, men who fatten on agitation and live well on union funds. I do not say all are alike, but I know some leaders of the unionists who brag of their influence and sneer at the men they dupe. Why not sign the unionist agreement? asked Wyndham. Would it not save trouble? Yes, said Ted Bryce, but I believe, as my father did, that every man has a right to employ who he likes to do his work. I will give them union wages, but I shall decline to be bound down to employ none but union men. I think you are right, said the artist. What a pity there is not more harmony between employers and employed. 
i expect there is a good deal of obstinacy on each side obstinate i may be said ted bryce but i believe in freedom unionism does not give men freedom for it makes them slaves it deprives a man of the right to think and act for himself but look win there's manda and we will drop this subject you can see how it works for yourself if there's trouble over the shearing the greys dashed along at a great pace they knew they were near home union or non-union arguments troubled them not they were happy under the control of their master acknowledging his kindness and never feeling their subjection manda said wyndham howarth hurrah for manda we are far from the madding crowd here at all events wait and see said ted bryce there's the shearers camp over yonder you'll see a crowd there that will amuse you and furnish you with a whole portfolio full of sketches End of chapter five Chapter six of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Girls The Battle Royal had taken place, and Mrs. Bryce suffered defeat. Ida Bryce gained the day, and Flora Hanworth was a visitor at Potts Point. Of course, Flora knew nothing of what had taken place or she would have been the very least person to have accepted the invitation. If Flora Hanworth was poor, it only made her prouder and more susceptible to the least slight. She knew how Ida was situated regarding her stepmother, and Flora had accepted the invitation more for Ida's sake than her own. Mrs. Bryce felt compelled to act amicably if she did not feel amiable. She was rather afraid of Ida, and dreaded a scene if she was not as polite as a hostess should be to flora hanworth still she could not prevent an occasional sarcastic remark and flora hanworth was quick to notice the least slight i do not think mrs bryce cares for me to be here she said to ida whatever induces you to think so replied ida with well-feigned surprise because of certain remarks she has made said flora my dear flora you must take no notice of mrs bryce's little peculiarities she does not mean anything she only tries to be effective and to say smart things said ida at my expense said flora smart things are generally said at the expense of some one said ida i assure you mrs bryce gives me very little rest she uses me as a target to fire her shots at but i am afraid they do not very often hit the mark ida you are not happy here said flora gently i can see that is there anything i can do for you be of any help to you i shall never be happy in this house said ida sadly it is not so much mrs bryce's manner to me as the thoughts of how much i have lost here that renders it unbearable you will go to your brother when you leave here said flora taking it for granted ida would change her residence before long yes replied ida he has promised to give me a situation as housekeeper at munda flora smiled and coloured slightly as she thought that she would not mind being permanently installed as housekeeper to edward bryce i am sure the situation would suit you admirably she said what fun it would be if we both went to munda while your brother is there said ida i'll write to ted and ask him if he can accommodate us he will not wait to reply by post he will at once wire back by all means come immediately how can you ida said flora who was nevertheless pleased at such a prospect we could not possibly visit a house inhabited by two bachelors you forget mrs o'brien said ida with a laugh bridges is a perfect she-dragon she would guard us from all dangers and draw lurid pictures of the consequences of too close an intimacy with young men mrs o'brien has been in charge at munda for years she looks after ted as though he were still a child good old bridget she nursed us both she is a large-hearted irish woman and mrs o'brien is better known out west than any woman in the district mrs o'brien's presence certainly facilitates matters i agree with you ida it would be capital fun but what would mrs bryce say asked flora raise objections said ida she will point out that such conduct on the part of two hitherto respectable girls would be outrageous 
she would say it was indelicate i really believe she would hint that i had designs on wyndham and that you were about to lay siege to ted's young affections said ida with a sly glance at her companion flora was indignant or pretended to be ida thought the pretence predominated such things might be said about our visit said flora demurely it would be absurd of course i am no fonder of mr bryce than you are of wyndham i mean in that way oh you know what i mean she added as she saw her companion laughing but i am very fond of your brother said ida smiling and i am sure you like ted we should be a merry family mrs o'brien would preside at the table and see that we behaved like good boys and girls will you agree to go to munda with me if ted will have us and your brother will permit it if you wish it said flora but this is such a sudden freak whatever will mrs bryce say she will say a good deal replied ida and think a lot more than she says but mrs bryce will have to give in it may be wicked of me but i am beginning to thoroughly detest mrs bryce ida you must not say that said flora remember she was your father's choice that only makes matters worse said ida it is for that very reason i dislike her conduct this is not right it is not like you ida said flora oh you don't know all said ida if you realised what i feel you would not blame me she has insulted the memory of my father it is that makes her society unbearable to me what do you mean asked flora i mean that mrs bryce has so far forgotten what is due to my father's memory said ida that she encourages the attentions of a possible successor to him impossible you must be mistaken said flora shocked unfortunately there can be no mistake about it said ida he has called here several times who has called said flora mr golding said ida your father's partner said flora but he is one of the executors no doubt he comes to consult her on business matters that is what i thought at first said ida although i had my suspicions mrs bryce was far too familiar with mr golding when my father was alive accidentally i learned mr golding did not come here on business connected with my father's will he came here on business connected with my father's widow surely there must be some mistake said flora mrs bryce would never so far forget herself as to encourage another suitor for her hand and your father dead such a short time you do not understand mrs bryce said ida i do i tell you it makes my blood boil to see how she encourages mr golding but has he no sense of shame said flora no idea of what is right and proper he was your father's partner he is a very religious man or professes to be so surely he cannot be such a consummate hypocrite i never liked mr golding said ida he once actually proposed to me i have never forgiven him for that insult insult ida said flora surely it is not an insult for herbert golding to offer you his hand it was said ida passionately it was a gross insult he could not possess himself of mrs bryce so he magnanimously offered to make me mrs golding he got his answer you did not insult him i hope said flora oh no said ida i calmed my feelings as he was my father's partner i declined the honour i said he hardly knew what he was saying i put it down to the champagne but he is a staunch abstainer said flora so he said replied ida he said miss bryce i never drink anything stronger than water and what did you say ida i said then there can be no excuse for your conduct and bade him go replied ida does your brother know of this said flora no replied ida i did not tell ted it might have caused trouble and poor old dad hated scenes ted would probably have thrashed him had i told him all this is monstrous said flora i always understood from the vicar mr golding is such a devout trustworthy man i am afraid your vicar is deceived in him said ida mr golding's outward devotions are very different from his inward meditations ida i want you for a moment called mrs bryce the girls were seated on the veranda and mrs bryce's voice startled them ida at once went inside leaving flora in her chair 
mr golding is coming to dinner said mrs bryce looking at her keenly he has some business matters to talk over with me so i thought it only polite to ask him of course i should not have asked any one else so soon after my husband's death mr golding seems to have a considerable amount of business with you said ida of course i have no objection to his coming to dinner he's not my guest you are so peculiar in your ideas said mrs bryce i thought it better to tell you now perhaps you will think an idea i have at this particular moment is peculiar said ida it depends upon what it is said mrs bryce rather nervously i have been thinking how delightful it would be for flora and myself to go to munda for a week or two said ida mrs bryce wished nothing better than to have the house to herself but she pretended to be shocked at such a suggestion really ida i wonder what you will do next she said how can you possibly go to munda mr hanworth is there it would be positively indelicate i fail to see it said ida mrs o'brien is there and ted and flora would go with me i have no doubt she would said mrs bryce sarcastically your brother is there i see no greater impropriety in flora and myself visiting munda than i do in mr golding visiting you said ida and the accent on the you was pointed mrs bryce was angry her stepdaughter had such an unpleasant way of putting things the cases are entirely different said mrs bryce i am a widow and mr golding is my late husband's executor it is necessary he should come here on business said ida with considerable meaning underlying the words do you mean to hint that mr golding does not come on business said mrs bryce angrily oh dear no said ida but some men have such a happy way of combining business and pleasure mrs bryce commenced to feel uncomfortable those calm steady eyes of her stepdaughter seemed to search her through and through and to probe to the uttermost her shallow nature she controlled her temper and said and pray when do you propose to go in this wild excursion to munda i am writing to ted at once if you have no objection to offer to our going said ida it would be no use my offering objections said mrs bryce you always disregard my advice if your brother thinks it a proper thing for you to do i raise no objection then it is settled said ida perhaps you will mention the matter to mr golding he may wish me to take a message to my brother mrs bryce felt there was some hidden meaning in ida's words she would have given much to know her stepdaughter's opinion of herbert golding she hardly understood herbert golding herself but she was fascinated by him and did not discourage his evident attentions to herself a shallow woman like mrs bryce was amenable to flattery and no one knew how to take advantage of this better than herbert golding flora we are to go to munda if they will have us said ida joyfully have you spoken to mrs bryce already about it said flora in surprise yes i thought it better to get it over she called me in to say that mr golding was invited to dinner so i retaliated by saying we were about to storm munda was she very shocked said flora very said ida to all outward appearances inwardly she was delighted to be rid of us now i will go and inform ted of our plans we shall look ridiculous if he refuses to have us he will not refuse said flora he will be so glad to have you there and some one else too i expect sly boots said ida with a merry laugh come to my room while i write the letter flora perhaps you would like to add a postscript on your own account ida you are ridiculous said flora i will write to wyndham while you write to your brother two such missives cannot fail to have the desired result replied ida End of chapter six chapter seven of who done it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain two men from my sister said ted bryce as he opened the letter-bag which had just arrived at munda and looked at the envelope he held in his hand from my sister said wyndham hanworth as he took the letter handed to him chorus 
What, what can they, they have, have to write, write about? about? The two men sat down and read their letters. Well, said Ted, looking up with a smile. Well, echoed Wyndham, returning the smile. I expect your letter closely resembles mine, said Ted. Probably, said Wyndham. I am surprised at Flora. Of course, it's quite impossible. What's impossible? asked Ted Bryce. That Flora should come to Munda with your sister. Nonsense, said Ted Bryce. I shall send a wire telling them to pack up and come at once. We shall be busy with shearing, but the girls will enjoy the scene. I do not think Flora ought to come, said Wyndham. It does not look well, Ted. Hang the looks. Let us consult Mrs. O'Brien, said Ted. Mrs. O'Brien answered to the summons. She was a stout, strongly built woman, with a coarse, homely, honest face, and looked quite capable not only of taking care of herself, but of a whole family. "'I'll give her a start,' whispered Ted Bryce to the artist. "'Mrs. O'Brien,' said Ted solemnly, "'Miss Ida and Miss Flora Hanworth will be here on the day after tomorrow.' Mrs. O'Brien held up both hands, gave a gasp, and dropped into a cane chair that creaked under her weight. "'Bless us, Master Edward,' she said. "'You're joking.' Mrs. O'Brien had made rigorous attempts to refrain from calling him Master Edward, but all had turned out failures. Edward Bryce did not object to it. He knew what an honest old soul Mrs. O'Brien was. "'I'm not joking,' said Ted Bryce. "'Here is Miss Ida's letter. She says she's coming and bringing Miss Hanworth with her. I think you know, when my sister states her intention of doing a certain thing, she generally carries it out.' "'Sure she does,' said Mrs. O'Brien. "'But it's dreadful. It really is. "'What shall I do with them, and the shearing coming on?' "'Can you manage to look after them?' said Ted Bryce. "'If I must, I must,' said Mrs. O'Brien. "'If Miss Ida says she's coming, she'll come, and nobody will stop her. "'Bless her dear heart. She always was so wilful. "'Worse than me?' asked Ted. "'Lawks, yes,' said Mrs. O'Brien. "'You was bad enough, Master Edward, "'but Miss Ida was a whole regiment in comparison.' "'Wyndham Hanworth laughed heartily. "'You've seen my sister, Mrs. O'Brien?' he asked. "'Yes, sir, and she's a sweet, pretty young lady. "'I expect I'll be able to manage her better than Miss Ida. "'Oh, dearie me, what a time I shall have,' said Mrs. O'Brien. "'Then I will tell my sister you will have all prepared for them,' said Ted Bryce.' "'I'll do my best, Master Edward,' replied Mrs. O'Brien. "'There's plenty of room for em at Munda, that's one comfort. "'I hope them shearers will keep quiet. "'If it come to war, they might frighten the ladies.' "'I do not think it would quite come to war,' said Ted, laughing. "'If, however, it does come to war, you must act as their bodyguard.' "'Guard em with me body, is it?' said Mrs. O'Brien. "'I'd like to see the son of em that had lay a finger on my young lady.' "'And she flourished a brawny arm fiercely. "'You see, Wynne, said Ted, smiling. "'Our sisters will be perfectly safe in Mrs. O'Brien's care.' "'In that case I waive my objection,' said Wyndham. "'Let them come by all means. "'I'm sure Flora will enjoy it immensely.' "'So it was decided to send a telegram, "'asking the girls to come at once.' and Ted and Wyndham would meet them at Louth. "'I told you so,' said Ida to Flora, when she received the wire. "'We are to go at once.' Mrs. Bryce was duly informed of their decision, and feebly protesting, she allowed them to depart. She had informed Mr. Golding of the approaching departure of the girls, and he had been secretly elated at the prospect of seeing Mrs. Bryce alone more frequently. It was a dusty, hot journey to Burke, but the two girls did not mind it in the least. To Flora, everything was strange. She had never been so far up country before, and the sights were new to her. The coach ride from Burke was not agreeable. Ida thought, Ida thought she had never been so bumped about before, and Flora was in constant dread of the coach capsizing. At Louth they were heartily greeted by their brothers, and the drive to Munda was one of enjoyment. At Munda, Mrs. O'Brien almost wept for joy at seeing Miss Ida again, 
and flora thought they could not come to much harm with such a good motherly soul to look after them they were quickly at home at munda and flora thought it a delightful place how quiet and tranquil it all seemed after the bustle of the city she was not surprised that edward bryce preferred to live at munda she liked him all the better for it he was so different from these town men so much more manly and self-reliant and edward bryce felt there was a new interest in his life now flora hanworth had come to munda the homesteads seemed to have undergone a sudden transformation since the two girls arrived their presence brightened everything and wyndham hanworth thought he had never seen ida bryce look so well as she did free and unfettered at munda mrs o'brien was here there and everywhere looking after the comfort of the girls the men could shift for themselves now it was her young lady she had to consider the girls retired early the night of their arrival and as it was moonlight and almost as light as day ted bryce and his companion went for a stroll in the cooler air of the evening thousands upon thousands of sheep had been brought in ready for shearing and they could be seen lying thick almost like snow upon the ground shall you have a big tally this year asked wyndham i think so replied ted i expect to shear about a hundred and thirty thousand what an enormous lot said wyndham it seems so to you said ted but there are larger stations than mine out west i've known sixty thousand sheep and lambs die in a drought it is simply terrible to see the tracks covered with bleached bones what a careless sort of life these shearers lead said wyndham free and easy replied ted they knock up a good cheque and then go to the nearest town and knock it down the bulk of their money i'm afraid goes to the publicans come over to the camp i see the lights are in yet you will see some rough customers the shearers camp was pitched near the main track which ran through munda station and was not far from the darling river there must have been a couple of hundred men there and as edward bryce said some of them were rough customers as they neared the camp several men stared at them and presently one man evidently superior to the others came forward good evening mr bryce he said glad to see you i was wishing to speak to you anything important dow asked ted turning to wyndham hanworth he said this is tom dow he's one of the unionist leaders but i'm glad to say he's more moderate than some of them glad to hear it said wyndham a little moderation never comes amiss you're right there said tom dow but there ought to be moderation on both sides i wanted to ask you mr bryce if you had fully made up your mind not to sign the agreement i mean to act as my father acted said ted bryce i will pay union wages but i will not be tied down by any hard and fast agreement i'm sorry you will not shear under union rules said tom dow if you agree to the rate of pay i fail to see what objection you can have to abiding by the rules my objection is this said ted i think i have a perfect right to employ non-union men if i think proper there are men who were here last shearing and i'm not going to send them away when they stood by my father and got him out of a difficulty then i'm afraid there will be trouble mr bryce said dow we have a determined lot of men in camp here and i will make yours a test shed that of course remains with them said ted i claim the right to do as i feel disposed in this matter they can do the same all i can say is i'm sorry said tom dow you stuck up for the men when it was hinted they had a hand in your father's death and you were right i'm certain none of our men would do such a deed if we did not agree with your father we respected him was it not stated during the election that there would be no disturbance at munda this shearing asked william hanworth i believe so replied tom dow but you must remember the men who made that promise were not as a rule shearers they merely expressed their opinion as to what the shearers would do i believe if it rested with you dow there would be very little trouble here and i'm sorry that it does not said ted bryce i hope however the men will agree to shear without endeavouring to force me to sign any agreement one thing you may tell them dow and that is i shall not give way 
I'll do my best to bring about a settlement, said Tom Dow, but my instructions are positive, and I must not disobey orders. What is the general feeling among the men? asked Ted. The bulk of them would agree to work at union rates without any signing, I think, said Tom Dow. There are, however, several men in camp who rule the others. These men will stick out for the employment of unionists only. Has there been any mention of my father's death in the camp? asked Ted Bryce. Yes, replied Dow. It is often mentioned, but I've heard no opinion given as to how it happened, or the reason for the outrage. It is a strange thing to me no clue has been discovered. You knew my father, said Ted. Have you formed any idea on the subject? Nothing definite, said Dow. At first I thought it was an attempt at robbery, but such turned out not to be the case. I shall never rest until the man who committed the deed is brought to justice, said Ted Bryce. I don't believe there's a man in this camp that would not rejoice to see the murder of your father caught, said Dow. Do what you can to bring about a peaceable arrangement, said Ted Bryce to Dow, as they turned to walk back to the homestead. That man has a good face, said Wyndham Hanworth. Is he a leader amongst these men? Partly so, said Ted, and he is secretary for the district. He has more than one camp to look after. You'll be able to get a few sketches tomorrow, for the men are coming up to the shed to see what arrangements I'm going to make. Will there be a row? asked the artist. Not tomorrow. That will come later, replied Ted. At this moment, a thoroughbred youngster galloped past them. There goes a young un that'll make a flyer before long, said Ted. He's by Phantom. Oh, by the by, you've not heard about the Phantom horse. I must try and let you have a peep at him. He's been running loose here for some years. No one can catch him. He's a wonder and a beauty to look at. The Phantom horse, said Wyndham. Is he a wild horse? A blood stallion, said Ted. He has a history which you shall hear some day. That two-year-old is by him. That's why I said he was by Phantom. I did not know you went in for race horses, said Wyndham. We have some well-bred ones on the station, said Ted. But I've never raced much, except at Burke, Forbes, Bathurst and country meetings. If that young Phantom is good enough, I shall send him to a Randwick trainer to see what he can do with him. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Old Wide Awake. The night Edward Bryce and his friend Wyndham Hanworth visited the Shearers' camp, Old Wide Awake was there. Wide Awake was well known to most of the men, and as he had had nothing to do with the shearing, the Unionists admitted him to their camp and he enlivened the night for them by playing the accordion or telling some story of adventure. Such men as Wide Awake, known only by their nicknames, are often found in the camps, and no one tries to find out who they really are. Wide Awake was bent on discovering if any of these men knew what had led to the murder of Mr. Bryce. He had a difficult task before him, because if his purpose were suspected, and they became aware he had a suspicion of some of their number, he would be in considerable danger. Wide Awake was, however, used to dangers of many kinds. His life had been risked too often for him to value it highly. He had seen Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth visit the camp, and observed them in conversation with Tom Dow, but they had not seen him. "'Well, Mr. Dow,' said Wide Awake, what chance is there of this affair ending peaceably? Not much, I'm afraid, was the reply. Mr. Bryce is obstinate. Once he makes up his mind, he takes a deal of shifting, said Wide Awake. But he's just a man all the same. Come, Widey, give us a tune, said one of the men. All right, replied Wide Awake, and commenced a popular music hall ditty, and the chorus was quickly taken up. The shearers were spread about in groups. The bulk of them were clad in moleskin pants and merino singlets, and were quite warm enough without more clothes on. They were a strange-looking lot of men, and some of them had villainous faces, while others showed traces of better days. 
Wide Awake, having played several tunes, put down his accordion and commenced to chat. Sporting topics were the chief subject of conversation. The betting on the next big event was discussed, and the chances of the horses summed up, according to individual ideas of their merits. Some chance remark gave Wide Awake the opportunity he desired, and he said, "'What a mysterious affair that murder of Henry Bryce was!' "'You think it was murder?' said one of the men. "'Not much doubt about it,' said Wide Awake. "'When a man is poleaxed on the head and his body is found in the water, "'there's not much difficulty in arriving at a conclusion as to how he came by his death.' "'I don't believe he was murdered,' said the man. "'I mean intentionally. "'Perhaps he got into a row and a blow he received was aimed at someone else.' "'A likely yarn, that,' said Wide Awake. "'It's as good a yarn as yours, anyway,' said the man, who was a bully and not liked in the camp. "'That's a matter of opinion,' said Wide Awake. Quarrels soon arise in these mixed communities, and the men are never loath to witness a fight. The man who was talking to Wide Awake was a big hulking fellow named Eli Spence, a bully but a coward at heart. His size made most of the men fight shy of him, but they would have given a trifle to see him taken down in a stand-up fight. Eli Spence was always ready to bandy words with any man, and he regarded Wide Awake as fair game to insult, or merely poke fun at, as occasion might arise. "'Well, your opinion ain't worth much,' said Eli Spence. "'I was at that election meeting when Henry Bryce spoke. It's my belief that Henry Bryce was not sober.' and when a man's had drink it's easy enough for him to run his head against a post or to fall into the water wide awake looked closely at eli spence when he said he was at mr bryce's election meeting what are you staring at said eli insolently perhaps you don't think i was at the meeting call me a liar at once i never said you were not there said wide awake you gave me the information yourself i did not ask you for it "'Then what are you staring at me for?' said Eli. "'I fancied I'd seen you before,' said Wide Awake. "'Oh, indeed. And where did you see me, Mr. No-Name?' said Eli Spence. "'I had dropped that, Eli,' sang out a man in the group. "'A man can go under any name he likes here. "'It's no business of ours,' came from several quarters. "'I saw you, I believe, in San Francisco,' said Wide Awake. Eli Spence gave a slight start. Then he swore and said he had never been to Frisco in his life. He'd never been out of Australia and didn't want to go. Then I'm mistaken, said Wide Awake. As to my having no name, I prefer Wide Awake to that of Eli Spence, ex-policeman. What's that, Widey? shouted several men. Is Eli an ex-policeman? Ask him, said Wide Awake. It's a lie, roared Eli Spence. I'll make you prove it. "'I can soon prove it,' said Wide Awake. Ten years ago, you were in the police force of San Francisco. "'I could not call to mind at first who you were. "'I do now. "'I recollect you being dismissed from the force.' "'What for? "'What did he do?' asked several men, "'glad to see Bully Spence finding his level, "'and yet dreading the consequences to Wide Awake, "'who was a general favourite. "'Let him tell you himself. "'I will not,' said Wide Awake. I only wanted to prove that my name is better than his own. There at all events as good. Eli Spence was in a towering rage. The accusation levelled against him was true, and he meant to take it out of Wide Awake. I tell you what he says is false, said Eli Spence. If he knows what I was dismissed the force for, let him out with it. There you were in the force, Eli, and you were dismissed, said a man. You have let the cat out of the bag, said another. "'Hold up, Eli!' shouted a third. "'Out with it! We are dismissed because you had too many gold watches at your diggings!' A roar of laughter greeted the speaker's remark, and Eli Spence, turning on Wide Awake, said, "'I'll make you suffer for this. I'll be even with you.' "'The sooner the better,' said Wide Awake. "'Bah! You're an old man,' said Eli contemptuously. "'I wouldn't hurt you for the world.' "'You'll find I'm not so old as I look, "'if you come any of your Frisco tricks on me,' said Wide Awake. "'Fair play, fair play!' shouted the men, 
rushing in between Eli and Wide Awake as the former made a forward movement and raised his clenched hand threateningly. "'Stand back!' roared Eli. "'Let me thrash the old fool. He's been blackguarding me long enough.' "'What did Eli do in Frisco?' said one of the shearers. "'Let's have it out!' shouted several men. "'Eli Spence was in the Frisco force,' said Wide Awake, "'but he was one of a gang of organised robbers. "'Many a man have they hit on the head and then flung into the harbour. As Wide Awake said these words, a sudden thought seemed to strike him, and for a moment he turned pale. He recollected the band, of which Eli Spence was one, were called High Flyers, and that their method of disposing of their victims was similar to the manner in which Henry Bryce had met his death. It must only be a coincidence. Eli Spence could have no possible motive for murdering Henry Bryce. It's a pack of lies roared Eli. I never hit a man on the head in my life except in a fair fight. If you must know why I was dismissed the force, alone I was in it, it was for kissing a lass who objected to my doing so. Loud laughter followed this statement. She couldn't stand you, Eli, said one. It's a bit thin, said another. It won't wash Eli, and sundry other remarks were showered upon him. Seizing his opportunity, Eli Spence aimed a terrific blow at Wide Awake, who now stood opposite to him. The bully was maddened with the taunts hurled at him, and could not control his feelings. Wide Awake sprang quickly to one side, and Eli Spence, overreaching himself, fell to the ground, amidst another roar of laughter. "'The old man's a bit too nimble for you. Have another shot at him, Eli!' Eli Spence scrambled to his feet, bellowing with rage. Wide Awake was ready for him. As he had stated, he was a much younger man than he looked. Sorrow and care had made him appear aged before his time. He knew Eli Spence was a formidable antagonist, but Wide Awake had been accustomed to fight his own battles for many years. The passion Eli was in would place him at a disadvantage with a man as cool as Wide Awake. The shearers saw it meant a fight, and they were determined to see fair play, and, if necessary, protect Wide Awake from serious harm. "'Come on, you cur!' shouted Eli Spence. "'I'll soon knock your head out of shape for you!' Wide Awake, in his early days, had been taught that once a quarrel was inevitable, there was a lot in getting the first blow in. Before Eli Spence had well got the words out of his mouth, Wide Awake's right fist shot out and caught the bully between the eyes, and then, as Eli Spence staggered back, dazed and astonished beyond measure, Wide Awake came round with his left and knocked him down with a well-directed blow on the jaw. In an instant, the shed was a wild scene of excitement. The shearer shouted and yelled and roared with delight. "'Bravo, old un! Go it, Widey! Get up, Eli! Are you dead, man?' Perhaps he's had enough. Such were the cries heard on all sides. Eli Spence staggered to his feet. He was blind and furious with rage. If he had had his knife in his belt, he would have made short work of Wide Awake. He rushed forward, and by the sheer force of his impetuosity, he got a blow home on Wide Awake's left eye, which at once commenced to swell. The blow seemed to turn Wide Awake into a different man. He avoided Eli as much as possible and dodged his blows. This was wise policy, as Eli Spence soon became tired and lost his wind. When Wide Awake saw him falter, he changed his tactics. He went in at close quarters, and in a few minutes he had Eli Spence completely beaten and at his mercy. He bided his time and played with him before he gave him the final knock-down blow. Eli Spence made one desperate effort to rally, but finding it of no avail, he gave a furious kick at Wide Awake below the belt. This cowardly action caused an angry shout from the men. Wide Awake, however, thought it was now time to end the battle, so he gave Eli a terrific blow on the temple, and the big man fell down insensible, and lay like a log on the floor. Cheer after cheer greeted Wide Awake's victory, 
and he took it very quietly. "'That will keep him quiet for a few days,' said Wide Awake. "'If he wants a return battle when he comes round, you can tell him I'm willing. Good night, lads. I'll go back home now.' And he picked up his accordion and walked quickly away to escape further congratulations. Wide Awake knew he had made a bitter enemy in Eli Spence, but he cared very little about that. He could not get the idea out of his head that Eli Spence was in some way connected with the attack on Henry Bryce. He knew Spence had been a desperate man in Frisco and had not stopped at murder, so it was hinted there at the time of his dismissal from the force. He meant to watch Eli Spence and see if he could glean some information that would either set at rest or confirm his doubts. Next morning, Edward Bryce saw Wide Awake had a swollen eye and was cut about the face. He inquired the cause, and Wide Awake related all that had occurred the night before, but kept his ideas about Eli Spence to himself. "'I'm sorry this occurred,' said Ted. "'It may make the men more difficult to deal with.' "'Spence was a bully and unpopular,' said Wide Awake. "'I think you'll find his defeat will assist you rather than go the other way.' Such proved to be the case. End of chapter 8